Hello, and welcome to the Mythos exhibition at the Target Gallery. Um, I'm Michelle Greet, a professor at George Mason University and worked on selecting the objects for this show. Um, so what I thought I would do is start with an overview and tell you a little, few of the ideas that I was thinking about as I conceived of and selected the objects in the show, and then go into a little bit more detail with the specific works. The artists represented here address the concept of myth in truly expansive and creative ways. Many of the works submitted for consideration referenced Greek and Roman traditions, and I selected many of those, but others draw on a broader concept of myth, looking to legends from around the world, including Persian, Hindu, Christian, Native American, Hawaiian, Norse, Yoruba, Loatian, Celtic, and Chinese cultures. Geographic and cultural diversity therefore played a significant part in the selection process, as I felt it important to present a global vision of myth and legend to demonstrate how storytelling, ritual, and tradition define culture and serve as a means to mediate the mysterious and unexplainable aspects of life. Other works in the exhibition reimagine fairy tales and magical creatures, or employ archetypes, allegories, or mythical narratives to explore personal tragedies and triumphs. Thus Shiva and Nike, griffins and unicorns, Medusa and Red Riding Hood occupy these walls together and speak to one another across time and culture. In terms of process, a common theme is an emphasis on detail. Intricate renderings of figures, patterns, and designs draw the viewer in and invite close looking. Additionally, many of the works employ collage, incorporating paper, jewels, rocks, and other objects to raise the flat surface and create a, a sense of texture and three-dimensionality. Through the use of layering, collage, and transparency, many of the works suggest change over time, transformation, or the reconciliation of contrasting ideas and techniques. The works presented here explore the theme of myth in various media, from painting, photography, and sculpture to mixed media installations. The artists use color and abstraction, composition and form, to emphasize the emotional impact of narrative and to highlight aspects of a story that many uh, that may perhaps be hidden or subliminal in oral or textual forms. In other words, visual representation narrates differently than the written word. It's different than reading a myth. Rather than choosing uh, works that directly illustrate myths and legends, my selection process focused on works that transformed or reinterpreted the original tale to make it relevant to our contemporary reality. Several of the artists included here revisit traditional stories from a feminist perspective, challenging the dichotomy of good and evil, where the female is often evil, to, re to reinvent mythical creatures as complex feeling beings sometimes trapped in intolerable circumstances. Across the board, the works collected here look to ancient symbols and stories as metaphors for the struggles of contemporary life, indicating just how relevant myth continues to be in these trying times. The first work we have in the exhibition is a work on paper by Annie Rochelle entitled Europe and the Bull, um, The First Euro Trip. Um, this uh, the work appealed to me for various reasons. Um, first of all, it's a retelling or an inversion of a well-known Greek myth, but told from a female perspective um, that really shifts the meaning of the entire piece um, and shifts it towards um, an adventure or a positive experience of backpacking across Europe as a sort of rite of passage akin to the hero's journey. Um, the style of the work very much appealed to me. It's in the style of um, kind of illustrations in ch of children fairy tales and so um, it kind of came alive in this kind of drawing quality. A bright splash of color in the red backpack draws our attention and becomes um, the attribute of the traveler um, rather than the kind of difficult details of the original story of Europa and uh, the bull. I also like the detail of the different languages on the signpost which su suggests the idea of an unknown or an untranslated space. Next, we have a work by Papanek Mill. Um, it's entitled Preparing for Winter. Once again, the animals were conscious of a vague uneasiness 
one, um, which a wonderful title. Um, I was drawn to this work both in terms of its theme and its technique. Um, the artist's use of transparency and layering and collage um, facilitated several interesting kind of juxtapositions, this kind of merging of opposites. So we have images of children's toys that contrast with the very serious kind of Greek centaur. Um, we have farm animals that contrast with fantastical beasts. We have the idea of the past with the president, present um, and politics and myth. And so all of this kind of layering um, gives a very rich uh, sense of story to the work. As the artist explains, um, the work references George Orwell's allegorical novel, Animal Farm, to highlight the danger of political naivete or the idea of the lack of knowledge about the structural manipulation of the government could lead to some very undesirous consequences. Um, and so this, this work really fits into the larger theme of the exhibition I selected many of them that refer to myths that comment uh, or use myth to comment on the contemporary political circumstances of the day. Florence Alfano McEwen's uh, piece entitled Leadership is More Than Howling, One Half E.V., is from her Red Riding Hood series. Um, and it again fits into this theme of female empowerment that we see in so many of the works in this exhibition. Um, in the story, the traditional uh, Red Riding Hood story, the little girl and her grandmother are viciously taken advantage of by uh, the wolf. Uh, but here we have an inversion of the story, Red Riding Hood is grown up um, and she is in the presence of her male wolf or the kind of male predator or alter ego um, but she's not powerless this kind of splash of red in the cape draws our eyes to the female protagonist and envelops her in a swirl of power the cape becomes more of a superhero cape than that of a naive little girl and now the man and woman are the same size they're balanced in the composition um, and so you can see this kind of tension or, or power dynamic um, between them. And again, this artist uses collage and layers of meaning for, uh, and builds on the traditional fairy tale and makes it more complex for our modern world. K. Johnson Bowles' Death by a Thousand Cuts, Mobbing, um, comes from her se the series um, Veronica's Clothes. Uh, and it's interesting here that the artist is using um, the biblical story as myth. Again, we see an artist using collage to create layers of meaning um, and to deal with contemporary social issues. Um, in this case, the issue of women's harassment and victimization. And what's interesting here is we see a parallel between the suffering of Christ or Christ martyrdom. We see at the center an image of just the, the, the torso of Christ and his hands um, with the stigmata, the bloody cuts where the hands were pierced or penetrated. And these become symbols of female suffering. Overlaying this image all around are the extremely feminine lace and embroidered flowers. Um, and so there's again this juxtaposition between the suffering Christ and this very feminine um, layering of collage uh, covered with red tassels that could refer to blood, but as the artist states also imply strippers pasties. And so this, this place of victimization. Um, and we also have the letters that I found very interesting, the letters F-U. Um, they look like a university insignia, so where, and that's often a place where violence against women occurs. But of course, they also refer to the very empowering expletive F-U. Nico Gosal's Srikandi um, refers to Hindu mythology to deal with the issue of transgen transgenderism. Um, it's a very interesting painting. It's painted on silk and it's highly detailed linear quality that goes all over the surface. On, it, they, it centers around a figure um, that is highly distorted, which becomes the distortion of the figure becomes kind of a metaphor for the experience of transformation or transgender, um, the figure of the transgendered individu individual. Um, and exploding from the figure are all of these pa linear patterns um, that come out um, and, and layer the surface in a decorative way. Um, and so it gives this idea of transformation that kind of ex explodes out from the central figure. 
Kenneth Reed's Transformer is a really interesting work. It references the Hindu god um, Shiva, but also um, is clearly referencing modern technology. So it's bringing together um, this idea of the ancient myth combined with the issues um, relevant to the modern day and modern technology. I was drawn to it for um, its eclecticism. Uh, this this work um, has a, all these hands coming out of it, and in each hand um, is a very strange object, a battery of skull bracelet, a sequin, a light bulb, a plastic crescent moon. Um, and so it brings together all of these objects that reference the past and the present and the future. Um, and it begins to question how myth is relevant in modern times. The work itself has um, two closed eyes and then the, the, the third eye of Shiva in the center starting to open up. And it's this idea of revelation. But at the same time, there's a crack in the surface that suggests the challenge or difficulty of transitions between the old and the new. Ken Beerbaum's uh, Mystical Cyclist is another work that really just drew me in. It's a small scale um, sculpture of a unicorn riding a unicycle. Um, and so again, you have this play on words, the unicorn and the unicycle. Um, but it's also just a really interesting commentary. Um, as the artist states, he's commenting here on the ubiquity of unicorn images in modern commercial culture. Um, and so, you know, the unicorn at, um, drink at Starbucks or the unicorn um, blow ups um, for the swimming pool. Um, but this work is different. It's quirky and inviting and small in stature, and its unassuming lack of color differentiates it from the kind of overly pink and rainbow variety um, unicorns that are so commercial. Um, and what's also interesting is the impossibility of the action, a unicorn riding a unicycle, um, and that action itself makes it magical or mystical as stated in the title. Rosemary Luckett's Seeking Confidence is another really powerful work, and it brings us back to this theme of women's empowerment. Um, its emphasis on different bodies is really interesting. There is the one body that is powerful, grounded, and painted in a deep royal blue, and it has these kind of powerful um, thighs. And then there's another body connected to that one, another female body, hanging by a thread with its legs kind of dissolving into the space. Um, it's hanging, it's ephemeral, uh, precarious. And so these seem to be um, two sides of the same coin. But there's also an interesting transformation taking place. Um, the arm of the larger figure is turning into a branch, which becomes a support for the smaller, more precarious figure. Um, and so there's this idea of balance um, between those two figures and the working together and the symbiosis. I also love the decorative quality of this. There's a collage element, a decorative vase-like structure um, that resonates with the piece at the center of the room that I'll speak about later called Panis Angelicus. Um, and it has this ornate decorative quality to it um, that, that resonates with the piece in the room. So this, this use of collage and texture uh, and bodies really communicate um, this message of empowerment. The piece is Michelle Simoneau's I Will Not Be Flung Over the Precipice. Um, this is a rather large scale work and it has a powerful presence of a figure in the center that looks kind of like a griffin, um, but it has a female face. Um, with it has these large, expansive wings and clawed feet, um, a fanged mouth, but it also has this kind of voluptuous presence to the body, and it's winged and powerful. Um, it uses, it has some wonderful collage elements to it as well, um, with uh, to the textured hair that seems to be glued on and these kind of glinting glass eyes, and the use of metallic paint makes it a really... Um, a kind of overwhelming presence. Um, and so there's this idea of kind of power and fear that merge together as one. Also in the center of the room is John Joseph Russo's Hands, Hands of Gods, Jupiter and Io. It is made out of white alabaster, so it goes nicely with um, Panis Angelicus that is also pure white in color. But the work itself is quite different. It embodies many dualities um, in both shape and technique as well as meaning. In terms of its shape, it is kind of a circular um, work that you have to walk around the outside, but then you can also peer into the negative space in the middle. When you do so, you notice this kind of hidden heart 
heart shape in the middle that is it's just wonderful a detail this heart referencing referencing the love between um, Jupiter and Eo uh, but you also see dualities here between gods and man the dualities between positive and negative space and in technique the dualities between the smooth surface in some sections and the roughness in other sections all of this um, references this idea of transformation or change um, and has a very sensual quality to the workings of the alabaster. Christy Kud's um, Delphi is one of the few fully abstract works in the show. Um, but despite the fact that it's abstract, um, it seems to have a very highly symbolic presence. Um, the work is made out of a very fine metal mesh um, that glints in the lights um, of, of rainbow colors. So as you move around the sculpture, um, it has this kind of shimmering quality. Um, and you can see through the metal mesh, giving it a sense of transparency and fragility. Um, the form itself is kind of vaguely uh, vaginal and it has these hair-like tendrils um, and so it gives us this kind of feminine presence um, and the power of the Oracle of Delphi, this idea of telling the future but the kind of looking through into um, this ephemeral future or not knowing exactly what's coming up next. Cindy Packard Richmond's Roman Gods Then and Now is a traditional oil painting, but it captures a wonderful juxtaposition um, that she observed on a trip to Rome. Um, and that's that juxtaposition of the old and the new. Um, what she paints is a scene of Bernini's Poseidon statue. Um, behind, or in, uh, behind it is an ad for Cecily clothing that has kind of a reclining male um, figure, uh, very eroticized. Uh, and so the issue here is is um, the kind of continual exploration of male eroticism. What I love about this work as well are the wonderful details um, that tattoos on the male figure, the claw necklace around his neck, um, and then of course on the statue is a pigeon um, and some pock marks in the marble which makes brings it very much into the present day. Judith Thompson's The Colorist is another extremely vibrant painting that draws you in immediately with the color, the texture, and the pattern. Um, and then you start to become more involved in the story that you're looking at. Now, this is interesting, an interesting work because it is not a reference to a specific culture or tradition. Instead, it becomes, it, it proposes the artist as myth maker, this idea that the artist through the application of color and design can actually transform the world and bring the world to life. And she does this in this picture with the um, animals that surround the female artist, the fox and the pheasant, um, that start to come alive through the application of color. All the details in the painting, the hat, the clothing, the wallpaper are highly patterned and brightly colored. Um, and then the artist has this very empowered gaze uh, holding those paintbrushes. And so it becomes this artist as creator and creator of myth and story. Judy Talwing McCarthy's Father Sky, Gifting Mother Earth, is a tiny gem of a work. Um, to me, it tells a creation story um, of, of the creation of the earth and the sky and the planets and the cosmos around. But the work itself is so intriguing. It is, it's tiny, it's miniaturist, and with extreme details. Um, and use this, this process of collage that we've seen in many of the other works in the exhibition to adorn the surface. The artist uses shells and beads and plants and jewels and gems and stones um, to create this wonderful textured rich surface um, that inspires close looking. In the center of the room are two sculptural installations, one of which is Virginia Maximovic's Panis Angelicus. And I have to say, I love the title and the kind of play on words rather than Pachis uh, Panis, this re reference to bread. Um, this sculpture embodies, again, many of the ideas in the exhibition, the um, juxtaposition of opposites or the bringing together of the old and the new or different ideas. Um, what it uh, it represents is um, Corinthian capitals, so the very ornate Corinthian capitals from um, Greek temples 
that are transformed into cornucopias uh, that are kind of life-giving in terms of both both symbolically and in terms of food. Um, the sculpture embodies many opposites. We have the Christian versus the Greek, the angels versus the col columns. It seems to be both a tombstone or a monument or a life-giving cornucopia. We also in the baguettes see these kind of phallic um, long baguettes contrasted with the circular or vaginal wreath-shaped breads. Um, and so we have male and female here. And the whole thing is in white, um, which it makes it appear to be a monument or a tribute to an age-old idea. Alessandra Ricci's Pandora's Box is another extremely intriguing work. Um, for me, this work reads as Pandora's Box as a metaphor for human emotion. Um, so it's not so much about the traditional mythical story, um, but it becomes a metaphoric exploration. And what I love so much about this um, work are the juxtaposition of opposites um, and the way that she brings together these contrasting ideas. It's as if there's kind of an explosion of emotion from Pandora's Pandora's head. Um, but there's extreme contrasts here, the realism and the black and white of the depicted face, and then the abstract swirls of color that represent the emotion kind of exploding out of her head. There's the glossy black and white on the lower half and the um, white marbled color on the top um, at part of the composition. There's the external control on the lower half and the internal turmoil on the upper half. Um, so you really see this kind of composition and tension um, between opposites in this work. Petra Barth's Carnival uh, is a unique work in the exhibition. It's the only photograph in the exhibition, or the only photograph by itself, and it's also the only work that stems from a South American tradition. Um, we have lots of references to East Asian or Asian Indian um, myth or Greek and Roman myth, but in this case it's about um, South American stories and legends. What's really interesting here is about the contrast with photographic realism uh, and what's happening in the photograph, the storytelling and the events captured that deal with this idea of music and procession and ritual to perpetuate um, the legends and traditions of a region. The other thing that drew me in about this um, work was the composition. It's a wonderful composition. There's a repetition of circles here in the hats, in the trombones um, that repeat and kind of become a metaphor for me of this kind of cyclical nature of time. There's also an overriding whiteness, the whiteness of the sky, the whiteness of the trombones, the whiteness of the costumes, um, but that's contrasted with the shadowed faces of the uh, trombone players. Um, so there's wonderful contrasts here in, um, in this work in terms of shape, in terms of color, in terms of composition that reveal the stories that are happening within. Saya Benham's Talisman of Hard Days One uh, takes up the mythological theme of Persian demons, but she uses these Persian demons as a way to um, question the evils of modern life. I think this piece resonates quite strongly with um, Kenneth Reed's Transformer on the opposite wall that both deal with this idea of tradition and modern technology. Uh, and so if you look closely, the technique of this work looks quite traditional. It's miniaturist, it has kind of these calligraphic brush strokes, but as you're drawn into the image, you realize that they're images of viruses, which could perhaps refer to the coronavirus, um, and then you look more closely and you see um, indications of binary codes, zeros and ones, but it's done in such a way that looks like an ancient hieroglyph. So this work, like so many in this exhibition, combines um, tradition with modernity, technology with um, the past, um, and, and questions the whole idea of the evils of modern life, but also how we explore and reconcile these. Uh, lastly, I was drawn in by the use of, again, extremely fine detail and fine lines, metallic paint, and the calligraphic effect of the entire uh, work as a whole. Alice Cress's Goddess of Victory Number no. 4 is another work that really intrigued me. Uh, at first glance, it looks like almost an entirely abstract work. Um, but as you learn how she made it, um, you realize that it was made by disassembling a Nike box, a Nike box from a pair of shoes, um, and then taking prints. And you can actually see the corrugations, corrugations of the box and the shape of the box in the frame. And then um, it, she, it, with the print, it takes on a humanoid noise 
polaroid form. What's interesting here is then you have this dual meaning, which is again such a common theme in this exhibition, this reference to the goddess of victory in the idea of Nike, but also the Nike sneaker, um, which through the, Nike, the, uh, the modern Nike ads or the idea of the sports figure is kind of the modern hero. Um, so there's this juxtaposition with the past and the present, sports and um, and mythological figures that we've seen, this modernity and tradition that we've seen in so many of the works in this Hedrick's exhibition. Uh, Medusa is a traditional oil painting, but what drew me to this work was her reinterpretation of this traditional story. Uh, we take it from the perspective of Medusa, who becomes a powerful figure in the way she gazes out at um, the viewer. And she has a kind of, it becomes a powerful figure that occupies this whole, um, the whole composition. But what's interesting here is that she's not the villain, that she's not the the a kind of dangerous figure. Um, but instead, she has this strong, powerful gaze and the snakes of her hair become subdued. Um, there are these kind of gentle green um, snakes that, with almost a friendly sense. Her dress has this wonderful metallic patterning and surface uh, to it. And she becomes a very human figure um, who went through difficult circumstances rather than this kind of evil villain.